I'd also like to take a moment uh, to recognize uh, right now uh, Grace and Andrew. They're the two in here. Uh, Zach's upstairs and then uh, Libby's sick. But they're the four that uh, dedicated themselves to uh, their devotions, church attendance, church activities, activities, youth activities, and got enough points to go to the Pacers game. Uh, we were able to get uh, some donations. Uh, we got row 13 tickets uh, for the Pacers game. Awesome seats. I've never said anywhere. I've never been to an NBA game, much less sit that close. Uh, so they got the ticket, dinner, and then a uh, souvenir for their efforts and uh, approximately, what, almost $200 value and paid 25 bucks. So uh, if you would give them a hand for their efforts. I think it's important as a church we encourage them and uh, build them up when they do well and encourage them to continue in that way. And then also for those that didn't quite make it, to encourage them to pick it up and do better this next time. This, uh, the next one for the Stand Firm program will be uh, Top Golf. Uh, I've heard it best explained by Miss Jamie is uh, bowling for golf. So we'll see how that goes. We showed them a video this morning and they looked like they'd enjoy it. So hopefully it'll go that way. But this evening we'll be in, start out in Psalms 127 verse 1. I'm going to put a little asterisk on tonight's message in that I want, we're going to speak on the godly home and in no way do I have it figured out or, and have a perfect home. So this is just as much for me as it is for you, you tonight. Every one of us in here are in some stage of our homes, whether it's a young home, you're just getting started or getting ready to get started where you have your seasoned homes, ones that, you know, you got your teenagers in there, and then you have your very experienced, I couldn't think of a better way to say it, but a very experienced home. You know, you, maybe your kids are gone and you get working on the grandkids, or uh, your grandkids have got grandkids. So we all can learn something from God's Word tonight. But before we, when we, when we all got married, or we're getting ready to mar get married, we had this perfect picture in our head. Leave it to Beaverland, I like to call it. You know, you have the perfect wife, the perfect husband, perfect marriage, the perfect home, nice cars, perfect kids, uh, and what have you. But that's not, that's not reality, you know. Um, sometimes Ashley wants to throw a knife at me, you know. She hasn't, she, she hasn't really done that. But, you know, marriages have their ups and downs. Um, when you have kids... Sometimes you want to hug on them and kiss them and love them. Sometimes you just want to punt them out the door. I haven't really wanted to punt mine out the door yet, but uh, they're only six. Um, it's just not reality that everything goes perfect. We're our, you know, in marriages, we're our own unique individuals. Um, I have the things I like, the things I dislike. Ashley has the things she likes, the things she dislikes. A little background on Ash and I, for those that don't know, is we've been, almost been married how many years? There you go. I'm usually the one who remembers and she forgets. How backwards is that? <laughs> but we've almost been married 13 years. Uh, when we got married, I was in the Marine Corps. And uh, 12, 12 days after we got married, I shipped out for a year to Okinawa, Japan. Uh, so that is not the any type of way to start a marriage, uh, except you don't have to deal with them for a year. Uh, no. So I was stationed in Okinawa for a year. I came back, uh, did some minor deployments, and then in 2007 went to Iraq. War on a uh, spouse, I, I can't imagine. She doesn't even, she, she didn't go through the actual experience over there, but she still hates the war movie. So I can only imagine what it does to a wife. Um, and then after I got out of the Marine Corps, I bounced around through a few jobs. Um, and now we, at this point, uh, 
We have twin daughters that are six. Um, I have a full-time job and we do youth ministry. I say all that to say this. Life is chaotic. Um, one thing I forgot to throw in there that uh, add to her uh, saintliness is uh, I have PTSD. I've gotten help, so it, it's not quite as bad. I'm not uh, completely wigging out anymore. But, uh, no. uh, but the chaos of life, the things that happen in your life, are all tools that the devil uses to ruin the home, to take the home and make it something that can be used for him instead of what God wants it, wanted it to be. We also need to remember that back in Genesis, it also, one of the tools that he uses, that the devil uses to contort things these days, is the home was created by God as one man and one woman. The other, uh, any more today is there the, the um, gay and lesbian, I'm, uh, I can't remember the LGTB or whatever, um, is being promoted to further destroy the home. So tonight, it will start off in Psalms 127.1, and I think it goes kind of as a subtopic to what Brother Phil has been talking about on Sunday mornings throughout March, is what really matters is his, was his topic. And I think this could be a subtopic to that I was thinking this morning as he's going through his message. Psalms 127 verse 1 says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wake the watchman waketh but but in vain let's pray dear lord thank for this day thank for opportunity to come to your house and worship you tonight and hear from your word lord i ask that you put me aside and help it be you that is seen tonight lord help us to put anything else going on outside of these these four walls tonight aside and focus on what your word says lord Help us to see the importance of having a godly home and where, and where we can work on things to make things better in our own personal homes, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We, we intentionally, or not intentionally, but whether it's intentionally or, excuse me, unintentionally, let me throw this out there. When you're getting ready to do something that makes you nervous, don't drink jacked up java ahead of time. <laughs> Whew, talk about a rush. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Anyways, how many times do we do things on our own? The little things on our own. We try to do it without God's help, much less the big thing of building a home. I don't care if you're 19 when you got married, which I'll never talk anybody out of, but I would never recommend getting married that young. Or you're 30 when you get married. A marriage is not something easy to do, much less a marriage without God's help. Or building a home without God's help. Currently, if you watch TV or you look throughout society, the TV and what culture has become is a mirror of each other and what is accepted. Drinking and drugs by parents. How many, how many stories have we heard in the last year of... Uh, Parents passed out at the wheel high on heroin, overdosed on heroin, with little kids in the back of the car. Husbands and dads that are not there are deadbeats. Wife's moms walks all over husband. Husband is a weak pushover. Kids run the home. Kids are not taught anything or disciplined, and kids have no respect for authority. Yet this is what is presented to those that watch, these, watch shows and, pay, and look around as what's acceptable and what is has become reality. In Genesis 2.24, it talks about God created man and woman joined together. This is also, and the point in that, and what I'm using tonight, is that it's a picture of God in the Trinity. It is where God created man in his image, and he created uh, marriage as a picture of the Trinity. And Satan does all he can do to destroy that so it tarnishes the image of what God intended the marriage to be and what God wants the home to be. When the home falls, the church falls. When the church falls, the nation falls. We can see that an example of, 
uh, where Peter tried to address that over in 1 Peter 3. And, it, and on top of what's going on in our, our own country at this time, the home being destroyed. So if you would turn over to 1 Peter 3. In the previous chapter, Peter addresses how uh, employees should interact with their bosses and, and, and so on and so forth and being sub and, and subjective to them. And, and, and then in chapter 3, he address, it starts off with, Likewise, ye wives. And we'll read this. But Peter is addressing a stressful situation in the Roman Empire that cr Christians are getting stressed out in their homes as the Roman Empire persecutes them. And at this time, it was generally causing stress because the wife got saved, and then, but the husband wasn't. And went back in those times, that, that just wasn't acceptable that way. You believed what the husband believed. So that is what is starting out here, and it's kind of um, also something we can take from to help us today. In verse 1 it says, Likewise ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they be behold your, your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which, in, which is in the sight of God a great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in, in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to the knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Again, Peter seen the struggle that was going on in marriage, and, and, and I believe that the, the godly home starts with a godly marriage. The kids come later after you're married so it starts with marriage and we'll start as as we all you know ladies first in all things so we'll start with the ladies and a uh, couple things i wanted to pick out of here tonight is it says likewise you wise be in subjection to your own husbands i wanted to focus on that word own tonight don't let your eyes wander uh, and I might mention it again, but out of uh, approximately 30 guys that went to Iraq with, with us, uh, Travis was with me, uh, three of us came back married, and I'm the only one that's still married to the same woman. The devil wants to destroy the home because at times, and I'll say it as well for the husbands, the eye wonders. When the eye wonders, your brain wonders. When your brain wonders, your heart wonders. When your heart goes, you go. I also thought of a, a, a something I've seen in the show. A, a, a guy, it was a guy, he had his work wife. And then at home he had his housewife, the maid. His work wife did stuff for him at work. His housewife, the maid, did stuff for him at home. And then he had his wife wife. It doesn't work. Eventually it contradicts its, themselves. They get in their way. And the, the one that truly loves you gets mad, gets upset. It doesn't work well. It imploded and was disastrous. You have one wife or one husband. One, I don't know how these people do it. How... I have, it's hard enough to have one wife or one husband. These guys have multiple, multiple lives. It, I couldn't do it. But <laughs> couldn't keep it straight. <laughs> we are supposed to be dedicated to the one we give ourselves to. You take your vows at, 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 
at your wedding. Uh, and not only that is, it, that's for show, if you will, but it should be done in your heart between you, your wife, you, your husband, and God. And when you destroy that by wandering, you, you, you destroy your, the promise you made with God into that person. When it talks of subjection, it says, likewise, you wives be in subjection to your own husbands. This was not the caveman dragging your wife around by the hair, beating her and telling her what to do. Unfortunately, I think that's been a misconstrued verse. But it is being submission and show, as, as Christ was submissive to God and coming to the earth to die for our sins. And again, as I mentioned, at this time, it's referring to wives that had gotten saved, even though the husband was not. If you're showing yourself submissive as Christ is submissive, it is a tool that Christ can use to win the lost husband. That is what is being referred to here. And it also talks in verse 2, uh, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, uh, whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of plating of the hair and wearing of gold or putting of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in which is not corruptible evil, even the ornament of the meek and quiet spirit, which is the sight, in the sight of God, uh, in the sight of God of great price. Let it, when, there's not, let me, let me throw this out there. There's nothing wrong with wearing makeup. There's nothing wrong with wearing the earrings and some jewelry, blah, what, what have you. But it should not be your goal as women to let your outward appearance be what is seen. Let your heart be seen. Let, your, let the, um, the inward self be seen. Let it be the, uh, uh, we shouldn't strive to distract by our outward look. We should strive to let your, or I'm not a woman, but you, you should strive to let your, your, let God be shown through you. Is what I'm trying to get at and this finally spit out. We should let God, you should let God be shown through you, not by your, how you look. It shouldn't be done by looks. There's a lot of pretty women in here. But you shouldn't let that distract from what God's trying to do through you. And again, it goes back to being subjection to your own husband. You shouldn't want to entice other men. And, and same with the, with the guys. We shouldn't want to entice other women. Your own, and, and it's mentioned down there in verse 5, or I'm sorry, I'll come across it later. But down, down later on when it's mentioned in the husbands, is it talks about dealing with your own wives. Again, being committed. And before the ladies go saying, ah, see, see, this is, this is talking about something different. Ephesians 5.23 talks of the man being the head of the household. There needs to be order in the household. And that is why God, uh, just as God is the head of the church, the husband is the head of the home, as referred to there in Ephesians 5.23. And again, it's not husbands dragging your wives around by the hair back in, throughout the cave and beating them around and telling them what to do. I, I firmly believe that, and this is, hopefully she views it the same way. I know I have my issues, but we discuss things. But when push comes to shove, the responsibility falls on the husband. The, the husband's the one that's going to take the responsibility and answer to God for the decisions that are made for the home. Now for the husbands, in verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the, the wife, unto the weaker vessel, and, and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. We need to honor our wives. It is not honoring for us to go about staring at and ogling at other women. It is not honor, honoring our wives to make her do everything around the house. It is not honoring our wives, even though they should know better to interrupt us during a Duke Carolina game, <laughs> to ignore them. I'm just kidding. She, doesn't, she really doesn't bother me. Fred raised her better than that. We need to listen to them. We need to honor them. We need to get to know her. Just because you're done dating doesn't mean you should stop getting to know them. 
And the same goes for the, the wife. You know, you should still continue to get to know your husband. We can help with things around the house. Yes, I said it. Again, staying faithful to your wife. And before I address this, you know, and I'm getting ready to address the weaker vessel comment here. I have seen some butch women. Some very strong women. Like in the Marine Corps, they probably bench press me. You know, they put some guys to shame. So not all women are dainty and can't handle themselves or nothing like that. So I'm not saying any of that. But it, as unto the weaker vessels, guys, we are supposed to protect our wives, protect our homes. Women want to feel safe and secure, not, not just financially, not just um, when you hug them or hold them or whatever. They want to know that when they hear something break in the middle of the night that, and they wake you up because they heard something, you're not going to just hand them the batter gun and tell them to go do it. <laughs> they they want to know that you're going to go do it. They, they, they want to feel safe. They want to feel secure. And it is your job, and I firmly believe this, that it is your God-given responsibility to protect your house and whatever means you need to do so. We're supposed to be heirs together. Heirs together of the graces of life. And I'm going to address Part of the graces of life are children, as mentioned throughout the Bible. Being together, we're partners in all aspects. What's yours is hers, hers is yours, and so on and so forth. Whether it's vehicles, homes, finances, etc. You're allowed to have your own things. I understand that. But when push comes to shove, it's yours together. If something financially bad happens, it's both of you together. You both get hosed. If it's good, you both reap the benefits of it. But one of the biggest parts I wanted to focus on and we'll see it and if you'll turn over to Proverbs 22, 6, and as I refer to, is the graces of life, the blessings of life as children. It is a partnership. It takes both mom and dad to raise children. Pretty common verse, Proverbs 22, 6, says, Train up a child in the way... He should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Both mom and dad. It takes two to, two, two to have the child. It takes two to raise a child. And I understand there's some single parents that, 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 that have to do it alone. But it should be and was meant to be that both mother and father raised the child. One of the... Ways to do that is found in Luke 19.46. I'll turn there. I know there's a lot of flipping tonight. 19.46 says, Saying unto them, it is written, My house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. I want to focus on the part there. If My house is a house of prayer. If God's house is supposed to be a house of prayer, we're supposed to model our house after it, and our house should be a house of prayer. And I think the first thing we should start with is before the child is born, is praying for that child. Uh, praying that God, giving that child back to God. Letting God know that you'll raise that child for Him. You pray with that. Pray with the child as they grow up. Whether it's at bed, at meals. Uh, and again, we're not perfect at it. But we try. But, um, let it be something that is done with the child. Train them up in the way they should go. They should know that prayer is a huge part of life and the only way to make it through. Over in Deuteronomy 6, we should teach them to use, God, use God's Word. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9, it says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for, for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house, and 
and on thy gates. We need to make sure we share God's word with them. Teach them what God's word said. Teach them to read their Bibles. Again, nothing that we've done. But when I'm, I'm doing school, or I'm doing my daily devotions, they, the girls would see it. When Ashley does her daily devotions and works with them on, with, for cubbies, or what, um, they're in sparks now. When she works on them, that's showing them that that's needed as part of their life. They enjoy, part, sometimes when they go to bed, what they ask for for a book to read is their Bible. Now, thankfully, your kids see what you do. The kids learn what's important, what you make important to them. Have leadership in the home with your kids. In Joshua 24, 15, pretty popular verse. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As parents, you need to make the decision. And it should start with the husband. You need to make the choice to be the leader in the home to say that we will serve the Lord. The popular example is there shouldn't be a question on Wednesday or Sunday what's going to happen. You're going to be in church despite what's going on. They should know that before meals, you should pray for your meals. They should know before you go on trips, you pray for safety and, and so on and so forth. They should know who's the leader of the home as well. This also goes with the kids don't run the home. The kids are not in control. The kids are not the parents. I've seen, I've seen this example, and, and, and I, I, I agree with it. From the ages of birth to six years old is the discipline stage. From six to 18 uh, is the training and coaching stage, helping them through, letting them make some choices here and there, helping them. After they turn 18 is when it becomes the fellowship friendship stage in life. 18 till the, for the rest. That is when you become, can become, have a friend, friendly uh, marriage, friendly relationship with your kids. By no means am I saying it needs to be, you need to be Hitler. But because part, part of being a parent is loving your children. They need to feel comfortable to talk to you and come to you and those things. But they need to know I'm kid, I'm child. That's mom and dad. What they say goes. There should be no, no confusion about that with your child. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. If you'll turn over there. Don't worry, I didn't forget the kids. Because was what I was talking about. About the kids being kids and the parents being the parent. Verses 1 through 4. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and abdomen ab admonition of the Lord. Again, children need to obey and do and honor their parents. During the time that they're at home, they need to, you're supposed to teach them. You're supposed to uh, show them what is right. By lo a part of loving them is disciplining them. They'll tell you, Ellie and I tell you, they mess up, they get a spanking. But it shouldn't be something with the old, go ahead, find out what happens type mentality of provoking them. It should, you should make sure to the best of your knowledge that you've made it clear to them of what you expect. If you expect them to go clean their room, well, what's part of cleaning their room? They should learn to understand it, making the bed, putting the stuff away, putting the dirty clothes up, what, what have you, whatever it be. And if it's not done, they need to know. 
there's going to be consequences for it because they need to do what they're asked to do. And it's all training them to be productive, men and godly men and women later on in life after they leave, leave your home. We have a responsibility to God, our kids, our wives, society to have our homes straight and built on God. Our homes are a picture and a tool to be used as a witness to the lost world. Part of my hope and prayer is that Ashley will be able to say that, she, that, I, that I provided a godly home for her. I hope the people that know me are able to say that eventually. And I hope those that come in contact will be able to say that. And I think that's what, our, what, what one of the things that we need to focus on is... Uh, Brother Phil was saying, what really matters, it's not the score of the Carolina-Kentucky game. It's not the Duke-Carolina. It's not whatever else. It's what God wants for your life. Building a godly home. Doing the, uh, and the other topics that Brother Phil has covered. I don't have them all right here in my head right now. I apologize. And I'll close with this over in Psalms 128. Again, I'm not saying there's not going to be issues. I'm not saying there's not going to be struggles. But the blessed home is a godly home. 128 verses 1 through 4 says, Blessed is, every, blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as, fruitful, as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about the table. Behold, that thus shall be the man be, be the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The blessed house is a house that is a house after God, God's design. We want God's blessing in our life. We want God's blessing in our home. And again, not saying that there's not going to be issues. Not that I'm saying there's not going to be problems. We need to fear and respect the Lord and, and build, our, build our home after the design that God made it. It's a general umbrella of things, and you could spend weeks going through various topics. I hope when you leave here tonight, you're able to find what God would have for you to do better and, continue, and then continue, continuing to do. You know, that's a tough subject to talk about, um, especially when you're still building your house, when you're still uh, trying to be a good husband and, 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 and father and trying to have a home that sets an example uh, to the people around you. I um, appreciate uh, the study that went into that, Brother Chris, and um, you know, you put, giving us what the Lord put on your heart tonight. And uh, certainly there is something in there for all of us. Um, whatever our stage is, is to honor God with our home. And uh, tonight, as, as we went through those passages and the thoughts of each uh, part of the home, the husband, the wife, the children, being a parent, um, you know, the Lord has spoken to us on every level. Um, and so as, as we consider what was given to us tonight, um, you know, we look forward to, as God has spoken to us, what we can do to make me better. Uh, so easy to think about, well, if my kids were better, if my wife was better, you know, and all that kind of thing. But really, we need to internalize it and say, okay, Lord, what in there can I do that would honor you and help my home to be a blessing? Um, and so that's, that's the approach we take tonight. Thank you, Brother Chris. Again, let's uh, have a word of prayer, and I will be dismissed tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the opportunity to be in your house tonight, to go through your word. Lord, we thank you for Brother Chris and the time that he put into that, Lord, and being obedient to you and uh, bringing what uh, you've placed upon his heart for us this evening. Lord, um, each of us has a different role. And uh, Lord, I ask that as we consider what was said tonight from your word, uh, that we would be obedient to our part. Lord, um, that we would do the best that we can to make our homes what they ought to be. And uh, Lord, I pray that our homes would be um, a light 
in our dark world. That is, people look at um, our relationships with our wives and our children and our husbands, Lord, that they would see something different, that they would see that uh, there's joy and blessing. Um, Lord, we understand there's no perfect home because there's no perfect people. Uh, but, Lord, uh, we do have a perfect Savior. We do have a perfect plan that you've given us for the home. And I pray, Lord, that we would strive every day to do our part uh, to reflect you properly in our homes. Lord, bless us tonight as we head home. Keep us safe, please. Bring us back together at the next appointed time as we uh, serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.